Thank you very much, Gillian. Um, can I first start by just thanking the ARC team for asking me to write this research update um, and all of the assistance that I have been given as a qualitative researcher in looking at all of this quantitative data. So it's been quite a task for me to get my head around some of these tables and graphs. Secondly, I want to acknowledge the, the work of others that have done research around flags and murals um, and other areas of um, identity um, in Northern Ireland in the past, including Dominic Bryan and Gordon Gillespie in, in Queens and people like Professor Bill Rolston in the University of Ulster. Um, my interest in this set of survey questions, I guess, stems from my work around good relations and reconciliation processes in Northern Ireland more generally. And just to give a um, uh, just to set a little bit of context around this, in 2011, I did a piece of qualitative research and that was funded by OFM DFM, looking at what would the priorities in terms of good relations work over the next five years. Um, I interviewed politicians, policy makers, polit uh, political advisors, um, people from a range of civil society organisations and statutory bodies. And actually, very few people made mention of, of flags as, as a key challenge. Um, that's not to say that anything in the, in the context had changed particularly, but it wasn't when people were asked you know, to, to address the key challenges around good relations. Very few people mentioned the flags issue, and I had observed that in, in the research at the time. Um, one respondent had noted that in his experience, disputes over flags are often a proxy for wider political tensions which are yet to be addressed. And I think that we, we understand that to be the case in a lot of contexts. But the context has changed somewhat, particularly since the passing of the motion at Belfast City Council in December 2012 to reduce the flying of the Union flag from every day to up to 18 designated days. Um, and I'm glad to see um, Paul Nolan in the room as I'm about to quote him. Um, in the in 2013 peace monitoring report, um, Dr. Nolan called the subsequent loyalist protest the most serious challenge to the peace process in a decade. And I think that that shows the huge shift that had that had happened in the context in relation to the, the motion that was passed at Belfast City Council. The issue of flags, of course, is one of the three issues which has been addressed by the panel of parties of the Northern Ireland Executive, chaired by um, Richard Haas and Professor Megan O'Sullivan. Um, while those talks, which ended in December 2013, failed to reach agreement, there appears to be a new opportunity, albeit that people are quite pessimistic about um, the possibilities of, of a reconvening of the parties to discuss these issues in the coming weeks. Um, it's worth noting that the 2012 survey was conducted at the end of the year, but only around 20% of the responses collected was after the, the, the flags dispute took place. So it's really in the 2013 results, the results that we have now, um, that were conducted around October, November. Um, so less, just less than a year since the flags dispute had really begun, that we begin to see the impact of the dispute on people, people's attitudes um, uh, towards um, flags and other markers of identity. So um, today I'm going to, to look at some of the questions that, um, the responses to the questions in the survey. First, I'm going to just um, draw back a little bit and look at the results around two of the questions um, related to relationships between the communities. And um, then I'll go on to look at four of the key questions asked in the survey around the issue of flags, murals and curb painting. Firstly, um, people's perceptions of the number of flags that, have, that are being flown, um, people's um, sense of annoyance over flags and, and murals, um, the support that people have for flag flying in, in their own neighbourhoods, and then finally, a question that was asked um, this, this year, um, how do people feel about the flying of the Union flag from public buildings? So in terms of perceptions of community relations, there are two key indicators that have consistently been used to monitor um, public perception. First is a question, do you believe that relations between Catholics and Protestants is better than five years ago? And this is um, the slide for it. And secondly, do you believe that relations between Catholics and Protestants will be better in five years time? Looking at the first question, um, which has been asked consistently over quite a number of years, as Gillian has mentioned, the 2013 results indicate that perceptions that relations are better than five years ago has continued to fall. So if you look at the, the purple um, 
figures on the column um, which indicate those that think relations between Catholics and Protestants is better, that figure has been dropping. In 2011, it was 62%. The figure for 2012 was 53%. And now that figure has fallen to 45%. So that represents a 7% drop in last year's results. Um, and this figure hasn't been that low since um, 2003. Looking at the question, um, the response to the question, do you believe that relations between Catholics and Protestants will be better in five years' time? So people's optimism towards the future um, the 2013 results show another decline in those that don't think that the relations will be better. Since um, 2007, the proportion of respondents saying that, that relations will get better has fallen 26 percentage points among Catholic respondents, 25% among Protestants, and sorry, 24 among Protestants, and 25 um, among those that indicate they have no religion. So only 46% of Catholics and 35% of Protestants in this year's results believe that relations will be better in five years' time. And so I suppose it's within this context of um, one could argue overall pessimism, um, that's a context in which we're going to look at um, the public attitudes to fly, flag flying and other um, markers of identity. So the first question to look at relates to um, people's perceptions as to whether there are more, less, or the same number of, of Republican and Loyalist murals and flags on display again than there was five years ago. Um, this is a slide for um, the perceptions of the number of Loyalist murals and flags on display. Um, and we, we can see both the responses from um, Protestants and Catholics. Um, so we can see there's a very, or there's quite a steep upturn in, in the 2013 figures with more than double the proportion of respondents indicating there are more loyalist markers of identity. So from 18% in 2012 to 40% in 2013. Um, so as you can see from the graph, this trend is consistent for both Catholics and Protestants um, with a rise of 15 percentage points between 2012 and 2013, and a 25 or 20% rise in the Catholic response. Um, so this is the the um, the responses to those in relation to who um, feel that there are more or less of the same in relation to re Republican murals or flags. The view of Protestants remained steady for the years. Um, uh, 2008 to 2012, um, so uh, it remained at about 16% um, percent of those that felt that there were um, <coughs> uh, more Republican murals or flags, um, but that has risen um, to 27% in, in 2013. Um, so Catholic perceptions remain quite steady over the same period, but I think it would be interesting to further explore whether there was a notable difference in the number of Republican flags and murals during 2013, or whether Protestant respondents have become more aware or sensitized to this issue as a result of the dispute over flag flying in the past year. Um, the next set of questions focuses on responses, respondents' feelings of annoyance towards um, murals, curb painting flags over the past year. There are actually two sets of questions, one which asked people do they feel annoyed by them and one which asked them do they feel intimidated by them. I'm just going to focus on those um, feelings of annoyance towards murals, curb paintings and flags. Um, and so this is the percentage of Protestants who have felt annoyed by Republican flags, curb paintings and murals in the last year. If we look first at the view um, of Protestant responses, um, overall there's been a downward trend since the question was first asked in 20, uh, or 2004, not rising above 30% since 2005. However, there's some recent evidence of annoyance within the Protestant community Again, perhaps reflecting some renewed awareness or resentment towards Republican markers in light of the flags dispute. Um, in, in 2010, the percentage of Protestants who had felt annoyed by Republican murals, curb paintings and flags was 
23%. In uh, 2013, it was uh, 30%. So we can see an increase there. Looking at the proportion of people who report being annoyed by loyalist murals, curb paintings and murals, an upturn is also evident there. So this is the results of um, res Catholic respondents. The graph indicates the number of Catholics who felt annoyed by, um, by loyalist markers in the past year is up from 27% in 2010 um, to 33% in 2012 and 38% in 2013. So there's been a steady um, uh, uh, rise in, in responses there. Um, the interesting set of questions around um, how people feel about this, the um, flag, flying of flags on lampposts within their own neighbourhood. So how do people feel about um, fl the flying of flags generally within their own neighbourhood? And this is a response for both Protestants and Catholics. Um, since 2006, this question has been asked. And it's fair to say the majority of respondents do not support flag flying in their neighbourhoods. So around um, four fifths on average of people actually don't want um, flags to be flown in their own neighbourhoods. Um, this response is higher for Catholics than it, it, than it is for Protestants, but quite significant nonetheless. So as I say, overall, the majority do not support flag flying in their neighbourhoods. However, this figure has actually dropped slightly in, in 2012 and 2013, with a small increase in those indicating that they do support flag flying in their neighbourhoods. So this increased acceptance of flag flying, again, we can speculate around the impact of the, the flags dispute on, um, on the results. So it may reflect some kind of change in context in the last number of years. Um, one question then that we didn't have um, space for in the, the research update but I thought was worth um, reporting on um, was a question around um, support of flag, fl flying of flags on lampposts on special dates for special celebrations. So for, for particular reasons rather than, than generally all year. So people were asked um, to either agree or disagree with this statement. I support the flying of flags on lampposts throughout Northern Ireland on special dates for particular celebrations. And I think that the results of this are interesting. In general, Protestants are more strongly supportive of the flying on flag, flags from lampposts on special dates for particular celebrations. 53% of Protestant respondents either strongly agreed or agreed with the statement, in contrast with 32% of Catholics. If you add in um, those that responded that they I, neither agreed nor disagreed, so one could argue they're ambivalent about, about it, so, you know, uh, would tolerate the flying of flags um, on special dates for particular celebrations, those figures ri rise to 65% of Protestants and 46% of Catholics. Um, so, I mean, we can look at, at these figures um, in, in the discussion, but I think that it's worth noting that there isn't a, a blanket um, response of, of no flags at any time, um, but actually that there's quite a significant um, number in the, within the population that, that are quite happy for flags to be flown um, on special dates for particular celebrations. And finally, um, a question that has been, been added um, to the module um, in the past year is a question around the flying of flags on public buildings. Respondents were asked which of these statements about flags on public buildings in Northern Ireland comes closest to your view. So they were, they were offered these um, four statements and asked which comes closest to your view. If you look at the second row of figures, um, the most popular view among both Protestants, which is 48%, and Catholics, 59%, is that the union flag should be flown on designated days only from all public buildings. So that represents um, 
uh, an overall majority of 53% um, for this course of action. Um, however, 28% um, of Catholics um, feel that the Union flag should not be flown at all from any public buildings, and 3% of Protestants agree with this particular statement. So if we focus a little bit more on this um, figure, the 44% of Protestants that feel that the Union flag should be flown from all public buildings all of the time, and um, we did some um, additional analysis of those figures. So the, of those 44% of Protestants, um, we wanted to see where the, that depth of feeling was within the Protestant community. 61% um, of 18 to 34 year olds actually um, felt that the flag should be flown um, all on all public buildings all of the time. Um, and 35%, so less than the average, um, of over 55% agreed with that. In terms of educational qualifications, um, those the, the, um, who have a, a, a graduate degree um, or have graduated um, are, are the least likely um, to su be supportive of that view at 27%. Um, those with few or no GCSE level qualifications um, were those that felt um, most strongly about that. So I suppose in summary, there's just a few key observations to make, and I'm going to, to keep this brief um, so that there's time for Peter to respond and that we can discuss this more within questions and answers. I suppose a key observation um, that, which we make in the research update is that the deterioration in respondents' optimism for the future between Catholics and Protestants is cause for serious concern. And while there may be many factors at play, the dispute over, over flags over the past 18 months appears to have had a significant impact on people's attitudes, not just to flag flying, but more broadly around relationships between communities. The majority, or 75% of respondents, do not support flag flying within their own neighbourhoods. And I think that, that is, is worth noting. However, 53% of Protestants and 32% of Catholics do still support the flying of flags on special occasions um, and as special dates for special celebrations or occasions. So maybe there is some work to be done around setting some parameters at a policy level um, in terms of, of the, the, the flying of flags and the, and the erection and removal of those flags. 53% um, of people overall would support the flying of the Union flag on public buildings and designated days. Again, I think that that is an, um, an interesting point of departure for, for some of the, the debates that are currently taking place. And yet it's worth noting that there's clearly a polarised view still evident in relation to that that needs to be, to be addressed. And we are moving into a new um, context at local government level with new super councils, and a lot of these issues will have to be addressed and renegotiated. Um, actually, it, within some council areas, the issue about flags has been addressed um, quite a number of years ago, um, but it, there may be now, in light of, of the, the Belfast context, uh, a, a re-engagement with those issues within the new dispensations in the next um, number of years. So that is something to, to um, to be aware of and be concerned about and to be placed, I think, firmly at the centre of those um, discussions that are taking place within local governments across Northern Ireland. So 44% of Protestants believe that the Union flag should be flown from all public buildings all of the time. And, you know, obviously this is a response across Northern Ireland rather than just the depth of feeling within Belfast itself. But 28% of Catholics feel it should not be flown at all. And so they, those are polarised positions that do still need to be addressed, both at a political level and a social level as well. So I'll, I'll leave it there um, and give um, Peter a chance to, to respond um, to those figures. Thanks very much, uh, Grania, and absolutely fascinating it, was, uh, it is as well. Uh, and, and, and thanks, Gillian, also to yourself. Can I... Can I start by saying thanks for the invitation, but also uh, thank you for carrying out the, the, the work and the research. I, I think these are really significant findings. They 
enrich the debate around this issue hugely. Uh, and I actually think they throw up a number of challenges uh, to us as we go forward. Uh, I'm going to touch on some of those challenges, but I think the presentation and the actual statistics are something that people within the new Super Councils, Grania, you're right, um, should be reflecting on. And I think an informed debate with, with and between them is something that would be extremely valuable, all things considered. There are some negatives in the research findings. I think there's some positives in the research findings as well, and some things that it would be useful just to explore a little bit further also, um, which, which I'll touch on as, as we go through. I'm going to touch on five areas. Um, the first one is around what seems to be a divergence of views around the flying of the Union flag on public buildings. I mean, clearly there is that divergence of views, but some interesting statistics. In the context of a newly elected Belfast City Council, in a Belfast, as uh, Grania referred to Paul Nolan's report, Peace Monitoring Report, very clearly elicited from that report, it's a Belfast which is a city of minorities. Uh, yeah. The council area of Belfast shifted to having a majority Catholic population uh, compared to Protestant population over the last 10 years. The council election results indicated that as another hung council. There is not likely to be, I wouldn't have thought, in the next four years, a change in the Council's policy on designated uh, flying, uh, flying of the flag on designated days. I think as we reach five to 10 to 15 years down the line, uh, whatever the de demographics tell us at that point, there is a need for a debate now around it. And it's an, a very opportune time, I think, for Council here uh, in Belfast as well as elsewhere to, to discuss these. And it would be interesting to know whether there were any geographic differences around that. For example, what did respondents from Belfast say about the flying of the flag on designated days? I think the young people's response in that is both interesting and striking. And is it depressing or is it realistic? I don't know. What seems to me is, is that uh, this narrative that sometimes we hear that the younger generation, those under 30, are going to be different, are going to really move this situation on because their views will be uh, moved on and more liberal and more inclusive and embracing than the existing generation is challenged by these figures. Um, I think no matter what age you are, young people included, the ancestral voices still call, uh, they're still heard, and I think the figures reflect that. They actually back up some uh, work I'd done about a year ago with four to 500 16 to 18 year olds in Enniskill and Derry, London, Derry and Belfast with schools in Down and Antrim. And we asked questions around same-sex marriage and uh, around women's role in society and around uh, what was called gay blood issues. And in each of those issues, Protestant and Catholic kids were saying, we're way ahead of the general population. Of course, uh, there should be blood available from people who are gay as well as, as others. Of course, same-sex marriage is okay. Of course, women's role in society should be uh, much more equal than it is at the minute. But when we asked the question about flags, the Protestant kids said 365 way over here, and the Catholic kids said no flags are both flags. The divergence just went like that. So I think on some of the social issues, young people maybe are way ahead, but on some of those seminal touchstone issues, maybe they reflect the, reflect the views of the general population even more acutely. And this research is maybe suggesting that they do. The ancestral voices still call. We can't depend on a new generation being the change. I suspect that same debate was had uh, of the young people in the 1970s, of young people during the 1912 to 22 year, of young people in the 19th century and the 17th century. The fact is people inherit and grow uh, into some set values. And I think that's the challenge for this in some ways. We need to explore whether our response in working with young people, the resources that go into it and the work that is being done at a policy level where there are issues around shared and integrated education and other aspects of how young people are worked with is being pursued with the urgency and the resources that are required. Because the fact is that work needs done uh, if we're to make sure that in the next generation we continue and build on the peace process that we have. Second point, uh, interesting, most people still believe, and research has consistently shown, shown this, uh, that uh, they are opposed to the flying of flags on lampposts. Uh, I think 75% overall said we don't want them in our local areas, and nearly 70% of Protestant, people from Protestant background, 80 odd percent of people from a Catholic background. And that's after 
we have gone through the worst of the flags dispute from 2012 and 2013. Some notable differences in terms of flying of flags in, in particular occasions, whether it's the 12th of July or when Down win the All-Ireland, as I'm sure they will next year, um, people say, OK. But the research consistently shows they say, OK, but let's respect the flags and get them down very quickly after they've gone up. And it's the irritation and the annoyance of the type of flags, why they're flown, and the fact that they're disrespected and flown for too long um, that is clearly evident. And I think there's a positive there that still people say uh, don't fly the flags in lampposts. But it's in a policy context where the flags protocol from the mid-2000s and onwards, some people will say, isn't worth the paper it's written on. Uh, hasn't actually been implemented, hasn't been implemented, partly because if the agencies are to implement it, they need political consensus from across the political spectrum of all political parties to say, we support you in taking flags down or in negotiating these flags down. And that political consensus just hasn't been there all the time. And I think there's something for us all about needing to lower the threshold of tolerance for some of this stuff. Marking territory is wrong. Marking territory intimidates people. That's part of the reason why it's done. Uh, depending on the flags that are up as well to some extent, but whatever the flags in, in reality, and the murals and the curbstones, it is there to say this is our territory. It is there to say maybe you're not welcome, or to say if you are here, behave yourself in certain ways. I, I've said before, I was driving down a road in Belfast last year. My then five-year-old son was in the car. We stopped the traffic lights and he said, Daddy, why is that man pointing a gun at us? And after an initial second or two of what on earth is that, I noticed the mural beside us with a masked man pointing a gun, one of those pictures that the gun follows you as you walk up or drive up and down the road. And I thought, what sort of society are we living in when we tolerate murals being painted with masked men pointing guns at people who drive or walk past? What sort of society is my five-year-old and your children and grandchildren growing up in when we tolerate that? illegal, unlawful activity. It's intimidating, it's harassment, it's trespassing, it's criminal damage, but we tolerate it. And I think we need to, all of us, across the divide, need to lower our tolerance of that threshold of what is acceptable in unlawful activity. To use an analogy, some people say you can drive at 72 miles an hour on the motorway, that's illegal, but it's tolerable. To drive at 95 or 100 miles an hour isn't it endangers other people and endangers how we go about our everyday lives. Well, I think there are levels of intolerance, our tolerance of flying of flags, intimidating behaviour of murals and curbstone is just too high and we need to lower it. And the fact is, if we don't lower it, why would we expect people in some parts of Belfast or elsewhere then not to behave unlawfully in other areas of life? Is it a surprise when we tolerate that flying of flags and intimidation and murals that in parts of Belfast we then see racist attacks take place? Well, we tolerate other unlawful activity. Why would we not tolerate that? And it's just as wrong and just as bad. And we need to lower that threshold of tolerance of unlawful activity. At the time of the zero, people said, when the... When, on the route of the zero, let's take the flags down, let's take the murals down because we want to put a, a good image forward of Northern Ireland. What struck me was what sort of dysfunctional family are we living in? Do you know the family that, that uh, in private they, uh, they, they bully each other? There's a common thread. We, we have to behave in certain ways and you can only talk to these people and not them and you do what I want you to do. And there's a bit of violence and verbal abuse and physical abuse in that family. And then the doorbell rings and all becomes normal. It might be the neighbours, it might be a friend from university, or it might be the local priest or clergyman, but you behave normally. And as soon as the visitors leave, back to the verbal abuse, back to the physical abuse, back to the bullying and the intolerant tolerance. That's what the zero struck me as. Let's uh, pretend to be normal on the route of the zero. And yet, while the election posters went, came down on the route, a day or two before, the flags went up on the lampposts in parts of the route. And what happened? We tolerated it. We said, that's OK. And I think there is a real debate and discussion around how we, uh, how we move on to lower that tolerance level. Shared space is important. Uh, it shouldn't be sterile space. Um, diversity is important. 
celebrating in certain ways is important. There are cultural ways or cultural aspects of life here that we should respect and, and celebrate, and that may be about symbols and flags and other things in certain areas. So long as we respect difference, and so long as we develop our understanding of how people want to celebrate and the different things that are important to each side of the community. But shared space should not be used as an excuse to do whatever you want, whether it be flag flying or other things. That's not what shared space is about. Shared space is about thinking about what you do and how it is perceived by other people. And some of the questions we need to ask, I think, about flags as well as other things, are things like the proportionality of it, how many flags are going up, the intent, why are we doing certain things, and the effect of doing it. I always remember those three questions as being community relations isn't about being as nice as pie, P-I-E, proportionality, intent, and effect. It is actually about asking those hard questions about what is acceptable in certain areas to support diversity, yes, but not to support intimidation or bullying or other types of behavior through the things that we do, like flying of certainly uh, flags linked to prescribed organizations. As Paul again pointed out, and I'll be very quick, and I know I'm running on slightly, um, we have heard talk about a culture war. Uh, I think the, the issues around flags were part of that dialogue around whether there's a culture war or not. Frankly, I don't see a culture war in Northern Ireland. There have never been more parades than there are at the minute. There are 660 marching bands. There have never been more marching bands than there are at the minute. I suspect there are as many flags go up as there were 10 or 15 years ago as well. Um, I think the issue and the danger here is that those people who want to talk a culture war into existence will get a reaction to that. More people will then say, well, do you know what? Let's have a look at what there is. And the reaction might be completely the opposite of what the people talking up a culture war actually is, where we start to reflect seriously on issues around the flying of flags and other cultural expressions. Two last points. Political agreement, 98 onwards, is fantastic, was wonderful, very good leadership, but the need to build the peace is more complex and challenging. The building of the peace will be done by people on the ground doing work that is really courageous and difficult work. Um, when leadership happens by politicians, and there is some very good leadership, as with the agreements and onwards, we need to acknowledge that and we need to uh, try and encourage political leaders to be doing even more good political leadership uh, and civic leadership. That's why the Community Relations Council awarded an inaugural civic leadership award to two politicians, Willie Hay and Marcina Mullier, on Tuesday. I think they have been exceptional in recent times about understanding other people in the community, of standing up and actually taking in Willie's case, Derry, London, Derry in particular, forward in dialogue leading to the city of culture where, as again Paul said, a, 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 we got to a stage where a police band uh, got a standing ovation walking into Guildhall Square in Derry during the FLA in 2013. I mean, that was change that was spectacular uh, and done through dialogue and understanding being developed and trust in that city led by leaders like Willie Hay and others. Marching in Mullier as Lord Mayor, I think, has been outstanding standing in silence at the Armistice Day, uh, recognising that in order to move forward, we need to understand each other and we need to make those sort of gestures. But we need to encourage more political, good political leadership, and we need to have more systemic relationship building within communities. I think since the agreement in 98, it's one of the things that we, we didn't do as well as we could have, which is we, we made the political deal and then we, we, we left some things there without realising that the complexity of building the peace requires systemic relationship building and we're still suffering that and some of these statistics uh, bear out that we're still suffering uh, the fact that we haven't actually uh, approached systemic relationship building in the way that we should. There's been a fall as, as Gronje said uh, and this is the final point maybe two in uh, how we perceive community relations now and in the future. Uh, I think for the future it fell from 64% to 40%, thinking it would be better in, in, in uh, five years' time. That's worrying. At the same time, when you look at the graphs that, that Gronje showed, I think you do see something of an ebb and flow of what a peace process looks like. It's gone up and it's gone down and it's gone up and it's gone down. Uh, there have been times when there have been major steps forward. And the ups, I think, in some of the slides were indicating things like 94 and the ceasefires, the Good Friday Agreement in 98. I suspect 2006-07 when devolution was restored with Sinn Féin and the DUP as the two main parties, 
steps forward, bold steps forward, and people were greatly encouraged. And then there's the, uh, a dip back, and, and it hopefully will continue to ebb and flow and get gradually better. That's the challenge that we all have to make sure that it does gradually get better. To make sure it gets better, we need to bear in mind some of these points. It's not certain or secure. Young people are not necessarily going to be different because they're young as they grow older. The funding and support for some of this work is not nowhere near what it should be. The complex peace building work on the ground. <coughs> I mean, I look at things like interface barriers with a target for 2023. There is some infrastructure money going in to remove those interface barriers through IFI and the peace program, hopefully. But nobody can tell where the funding will come from in the critical period 2015 to 20 to build the relationships on the ground at these interfaces and it's those relationships that will determine whether the peace walls come down. But nobody knows where the resourcing, the millions of pounds that are needed to build those relationships to do that work in the ground is going to come from. And I think we do need to re-examine some policies, the systemic relationship building and also how we really invest in, our, in, in the future to make sure that uh, peace building and reconciliation is just built in uh, to what we do and again that requires investment because if we don't do it we can spend all the money we want on creating good jobs now on looking at health and housing and all of the social issues but they will not be sustainable if we continue to go back into the sort of community tensions that we've seen over the last year or two and that has the potential to get worse so we do what we can we build what we can Bill Clinton said finish the job I don't think we'll be finishing the job in this generation necessarily, I think it'll be 30, 40 and 50 years down the line. The people who will finish the job of building the peace into a more reconciled society are the very young people who these figures are suggesting are more divided on some of these key issues uh, than us. It's they who will carry the burden of finishing the, the peace process and we need to make sure they have the tools to do that. And it's our job to build what we can and make sure they have the tools in the future. Thanks very much indeed.